Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Alexandra Reedhead. I lead our work on tax at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and I'm joined by, by my colleagues Tamar and Kuzi today. Uh, welcome to all of you um, at this webinar where we will finally launch our guide uh, on uh, helping developing countries to understand and adapt to the global minimum tax. So as many of you will be familiar, in October 2021, uh, more than 130 countries approved a package of global tax rules that will affect taxing rights and tax policy objectives of virtually every country in the world. A year and a half later, we have a clearer picture of what its implications will be. The G20 still strongly supports the reform and a growing number of countries are preparing to implement the new rules as early as January 2024. When they do so, other governments will have to assess how their own taxpayers are impacted and make any required changes to their tax policy. At IISD, we have a long history of working on investment law and policy and more recently on tax. And today, and together with this guide, we're bringing together those two areas of expertise to look more closely at the impact of the global minimum tax on both tax and investment in developing countries. Uh, the guide is a joint effort with our partner, the International Senior Law Lawyers Project, uh, represented by Enya and also our colleague Zach, who will be speaking later. So we're really proud to have this partnership with ISLP and proud of the contribution that the guide makes to helping developing countries uh, be in a better position to navigate these important reforms. And uh, today, our webinar, we have interpretation in Spanish and in French, so please feel free to choose the language which you prefer. Uh, you can also choose to see the uh, slide deck in English, French or Spanish. So if you go up to the top of your screen on Zoom and click on view options, you should see there three uh, PowerPoints listed in English, French and Spanish. So please select the one that you would like to view. Um, and in terms of the format for today's webinar, uh, in a moment, I'll pass over to my colleague Enya from ISLP to introduce our guide. Uh, shortly after that, we will get into the guide itself, where Zach, uh, Tomar, and Kudzi will present the contents of the guide. Um, following that, we're fortunate to have a number of very uh, knowledgeable, experienced uh, panelists with us today. So we have uh, Anna, Annarella from SEAT, we have Andrew and Jessica from the OECD, and Claudia from the World Bank, and I'll, I'll go through and introduce our panelists more fully once we get to that point. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, there'll be some time at the end for any questions or comments from our audience. So please feel free to use uh, the chat function to write your questions there. I think we also have the Q&A function enabled as well. So please feel free to use that. Uh, and we'll do our best to get through as many questions um, as we can. Uh, and please, you know, feel free to add these as we go along and, um, and we'll try and address them at the end or uh, during the webinar if time allows and if it's relevant to the, to the discussion. So welcome again. Thanks for making time to join us today. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Enya to introduce herself more fully and, of course, our guide. Enya. Thank you very much, Ali, for the opening remarks. Uh, Good day, everyone, and uh, permit me to also extend our very warm welcome to you for joining us today for this very exciting uh, event to launch the final version of our guide. As Ali says, this is a work we're extremely proud of, and it's our hope that the guide will help uh, developing country governments uh, navigate these complex reforms in the international tax uh, landscape and also enable them to make decisions that best suit their uh, economic and legal uh, context. Um, the guide, I believe, I'm hoping that uh, you've had a chance to sort of read through. It's now available in English, French, and Spanish as well. Um, so just diving right into today's uh, uh, presentation, bit of background. Uh, sometime in October 2021, about 137 uh, member countries of the OECD G20 Inclusive Framework on BEPS agreed to uh, a two-pillar solution to address the tax challenges arising from uh, the digitalization of the economy. And this is referred to as pillars one and two. Um, our presenters today will provide more background or detail on the two pillars, but just uh, broadly speaking, um, the two pillars, which is pillar one, seeks to allocate uh, new taxing rights to the market economy. Sorry, I'm supposed to be flipping the slides, so just permit me. 
one second. Yes. So I just want to speak briefly about what the global minimum tax is about. The pillar one, broadly speaking, seeks to allocate new taxing rights uh, to the market economy with the aim of addressing the challenges associated with the absence of the fiscal presence of large uh, businesses. The way the, uh, the, way the, the pillar one is designed is to target the biggest uh, companies in the world, being companies with the uh, annual turnovers of over 20 billion uh, euros. Uh, pillar two, on the other hand, which is the primary focus of our guide, uh, is also known as the global anti-base erosion, which is GLOBE, and is the global minimum tax. The pillar seeks to uh, ensure that all in-scope multinational uh, groups are subject to an effective minimum tax rate of 15% uh, in every country where they operate. So the idea here is to address what is considered the extremes of tax uh, competition which has led to the so-called uh, race to the bottom, where you see countries now uh, competing to attract investment through their fiscal regime. So in terms of the guide itself, what we're hoping, at least uh, aiming to achieve, is to provide an objective perspective on what Pillar 2 is all about. We do not take a position. We're actually agnostic as to whether countries adopt the global minimum tax. The guide itself is targeted at policymakers and analysts uh, from developing countries to assist them in formulating uh, adequate responses to GLOBE. I also just want to mention that throughout today's presentation, you hear us refer to uh, Pillar 2, GLOBE, and the Global Minimum Tax. But just for your benefit, this terminology is all mean uh, the same thing. Uh, so why is it important? Why is this work important? Um, many countries will be affected by Pillar 2, whether or not they adopt it domestically, because it only takes only a few countries to implement Pillar 2 for most other countries to be directly impacted. One of the immediate impacts uh, that Pillar 2 will have on countries is that it will negate the effectiveness of certain tax incentives. For us, this is important, particularly in the context of developing countries to uh, lose valuable revenue by lowering the effective tax rates in a bid to attract uh, foreign investment. So it is in each country's interest really to uh, sort of undertake their own economic assessment to understand what the potential applicability of GLOBE is on their taxpayers and the interaction with their uh, domestic tax uh, system in order to make an informed decision on whether and in what manner uh, to respond. So the guide itself is split into four parts. I'll just flip to the next slide. And it's essentially split into four parts, like I said, and it's uh, first, it aims to explain what the rules are all about, the global rules are all about, uh, provide a framework for countries to examine the potential applicability of GLOBE on its tax base, the interplay of GLOBE with its domestic tax system, including uh, investment incentives, and also to provide uh, possible policy uh, responses that countries could consider. It also helps to provide a step-by-step -step approach to assess the likely economic impact of GLOBE on the country, as well as help identify potential legal constraints on domestic uh, tax reforms. So having set the stage, I'll now invite our presenters for today and co-authors of the guide to take the floor. Uh, Thomas Lazou, uh, our colleague from IISD, um, Zach Puga, international tax expert and ISLP volunteer, and Kudzi Mataba, also from IISD. Over to you guys. Well, thank you, Ani. I, I will take the first part here. Uh, hello, everyone. Zach Puga, as Ani said, and the goal for me is to start by giving, laying out the groundwork. And I know a lot of you are quite familiar with what the rules and how the rules function. But before we get into what might be considered to be the value out of the guide, we thought it would be interesting to just level set at first and see how Pillar 2 specifically works because the guide is focused on Pillar 2 and how developing countries should be thinking about Pillar 2, whether they want to react or not. Um, and then in the, for the purpose of setting out the, the, the basics and the rules here, I just want to start by acknowledging that two of our co-authors for the, for the guide are not with us today. Um, other people worked on this guide, and I'm thinking of Stephen Shea and Alicia, Alison Christian, who also worked with us on this guide, who would, could not join us today. Um, so if we go to the next slide, how, how Pillar 2 works. Um, and like any indicated earlier, the goal is to make sure that we fight against the race to the bottom. And to do that, we want to make sure, or when I say we, really the goal of the Pillar 2 or the OECD here is to make sure that we um, assure that each multinational company 
is subjected to a minimum effective tax rate of 15% anywhere they operate in the world. Uh, so the first step in the workings of Pillar 2 is to determine the company's effective tax rate in every single one of those jurisdictions. And you have probably noticed that I talked about it every single one of those jurisdictions because this computation will be done on a jurisdiction per jurisdiction basis. Um, so you have to look at each jurisdiction where you're present and determine your effective tax rate for that jurisdiction. And how we go about it, uh, determining our effective tax rate, there are really complicated notions that we'll try to simplify for this purpose, but really when we go into working with countries for um, looking at closely how they react to the uh, to pillar two, um, and when we try to assist in doing capacity building, whether through the guide or otherwise, we get a little bit deeper into these concepts on how actually you determine your effective tax rate. But for purposes of today and laying out the groundwork again, we try to spend a little bit basic and a little bit um, on a summary perspective. So the effective tax rate for the jurisdiction, you will have to compute your adjusted cover taxes in the numerator and your globe income in the denominator. And usually you start with the computation of your globe income and your globe income will have to go from your financial accounting net income a lot and you make a number of adjustments to your financial accounting net income a lot. What you report on your financial accounting net income a lot, uh, you make a number of adjustments that are provided under the GLOBE rules to get to your adjusted GLOBE income that you have here at your denominator. And then for your uh, numerator, you will have your covered taxes, which generally will be the taxes you will have paid or your tax expense um, in your books um, adjusted as per the GLOBE rules that will go into the numerator. And then that will determine your effective tax rate. And every time your effective tax rate falls below the 15%, you would have a pillar two concern for that jurisdiction. And pillar two will try to come in and make sure that that jurisdiction is screwed up to a minimum of 15%. So if we go to the next um, slide, after we have determined that you have an effective tax rate that may be below 15%, you get to pillar two to see how you threw that up to make sure you at least at 15 percent on a jurisdictional basis and one of the first ways we get there on the pillar two is under the income inclusion role and you will you hear me refer to it as an irr um and the income inclusion role will be that rule under the group that requires you as from a top down perspective to look at the parent entity and look underneath the parent entity and look at any subsidiary and really not just corporate subsidiaries. We're talking, we talk about branches in a minute, but even branches and permanent establishment, any presence in any jurisdiction that falls under 15% effective tax rate, um, the parent entity will have the obligation to apply an income inclusion rule provided that the parent entity country has adopted the global rule will apply the income inclusion rule to throw that up and make it to an, a minimum of 15, to bring it up to 15%. So again, these are very general rules when we get into specific cases, there are a number of exceptions to this. I talked about the top-down approach and it's very simplified. A lot of my client structures don't look like this where you have a parent and a sub, right? But this is for purpose of illustration, but you can easily think about cases where you have 10 tier, 20 tiers, you know, hundreds of entities within the structure. And the top down approach, which is the general role in the pillar two, can be very well, very quickly supplemented by maybe a middle up approach when you have a partially owned entity in the middle where you had an intermediate entity where the parent entity don't have the role. So there are complications and exceptions that can arise to this. But the basic concept is that the income inclusion role will require the parent to bring every one of its subsidiaries that may be below 15% to a minimum of 15% um, uh, effective tax rate for that jurisdiction. So that's one of the first pillars of pillar two, if I can use pillar again, <laughs> but there are a number of them because this may not be enough to get you to, to 15%. So if we go to the next slide, we will see and the, 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 an, an exception here, which Como is- pueden ver acá algunas excepciones para algunos países importantes que tienen, hay que lograr ese 15%, pero también, Sorry, 15%, Zach, pero también hay que... If you can just pause, I think our Spanish translator is in the English channel. 
sorry. Okay, no worries. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, please okay. go ahead, Zach. <laughs> Perfect. So we're talking about the, the adjustments that have to be made to your adjusted globe income to take into account your substance based income exclusion. So the rules basically try to encourage um, investors to or to, to to give them a bonus for what they invest into tangible assets or employees. So you'll get an exclusion from your global income as part of the adjustment for any amounts that are spent on tangible assets or on payroll and employee. And again, the goal, the policy here, and maybe Andrew will tell us more, but I believe is to encourage investors to, to, to really behave in investing in tangible property and in investing in, in payroll, which is always a welcome uh, carve out. So if we go to the next slide, the other way, um, Pillar two gets us to the 15% rate. Maybe let's go to the slide after this before we come back to the uh, qualified domestic minimum tax. Um, what must, there we go. Is the under tax profit rule. Uh, so if the income inclusion rule is not enough to get you to 15%, maybe because the parent entity does not have an income inclusion rule or has not adopted pillar two, then we can look into the under tax profits rule. And the under tax profit rule will allow any other member within the group that is located in a country that has adopted the two rules to be able to top you up to that 15%. And in this case, we'll have the ultimate parent entity in country A. And let's uh, assume for a minute that country A has not adopted the two rules. And look, I'm um, referring here, for example, the US, if that remains the case. You have those, the U.S. as a parent entity with a uh, sub in country A and it's in country B and its subsidiary in country C. Um, the U.S. not having adopted the pillar two rules, as an example here, will not be able to apply the income inclusion rule. So the income inclusion rule would not be enough to bring country, um, in this case, country B, which is a low tax constituent entity, to 15%. So we'll have to rely on country C because country C has a 15% um, or a regular tax rate to top up country B as the low tax jurisdiction. So the UTPR is our backstop every time the income inclusion rule is not enough to bring us to the 15% effective tax rate for the jurisdiction. And then if we go back uh, to the slide before this one, brings us to the very, very popular these days within the developing country uh, developing countries discussion and policy discussion is the qualified domestic top-up tax. Um, and the qualified domestic top-up tax is basically the role that will give the priority to the local jurisdiction if they so choose to top up um, the tax to 15% before any income inclusion role or any on the tax profits role is applied. So basically you allow the local jurisdiction where the income is earned and where low tax may have been determined to get the first bite at Apple. And here, Going back to our basic example of country A being the parent entity and country B being low tax, um, if country B adopts the QDMTT, country B will apply the difference between the low tax amount and 15 as the first priority, making it impossible for country E, the parent entity, or for country A, the parent entity, to apply the income inclusion rule um, because they will get a full credit for the qualified domestic. Um, uh, top of tax that would have been applied at country B level. So this, these are the very, very basic rules in a very, very basic way. Um, as you can imagine, these things get extremely, extremely complex. And that's what the guide aims to achieve when we get into around the table to speak to a specific country. We take the time to go into these rules and how they can become very complex very quickly um, to see how they may affect. And maybe, um, quick anecdote, right? We were working with a jurisdiction that had determined that they did not have big, a very small country that had determined that they did not have big uh, companies, so they may not be within the scope of pillar two, but for one or two companies. And then they realized within, when we got deeper into the discussion, that they had actually an intermediate entity that was under the terms of the uh, globe rules, uh, the Pope, a partially owned parent entity. And every time you have a Pope within the globe structure, the Pope has the priority under the application of the income inclusion rule. So the jurisdiction, which was a small country where the partner, the partnership was established on a 4951 basis, um, find itself that they could actually be able to apply the income inclusion rule at that level. There were a lot of 
low tax jurisdiction underneath the partnership um, and that kind of changed their calculus. So when you get into these rules in more details, you might end up being surprised in so many different ways. Again, but the goal here was to set up the stage and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the discussions here. Uh, I think if we pass two slides, we go into to Thomas. Thanks, thanks a lot, Thank Zach. You. Yes, that's that's always useful to recap um, recap the rules. And I think the examples also speak to the complexity of um, implementing uh, Pillar Two, or at least adapting domestic tax policies to Pillar Two. Whether you're a small country, a bigger country, developing country, or or, or developed economy, um, and also for multinationals themselves uh, to uh, to understand how this is going to affect them and how they um, how they react, they they respond. So in the um, what we do in the that's probably the, the meat of the of the guide is we provide a framework to help policymakers um, think about how this could affect them and what types of options they have in terms of, of responses. And so this is coming up pretty soon, as as you know, Ali and Ali mentioned in the beginning, we are looking at um, at least in 2024, um, quite a few countries already introducing uh, the rules. And in particular, countries that are that are the home jurisdictions of multinational companies are going to implement rules such as the income inclusion rule and the under tax payment rule that Zach um, described. So as soon as these countries do it, this going this is going to affect multinationals that have presence or headquarters in those countries, and these multinationals are also present in you know a lot of the countries in the world, including many many developing economies. And that's why it's important to think about that impact. Uh, now, even for countries that don't themselves uh, host multinational uh, headquarters of multinational companies. So on the on the next slide, um, we have a we can show that in a very a bit of a simplified um, um, framework of how to think about the impact of uh, of Peter two. The first step, uh, and we we'll look at it in a minute, is to think about is there an actual uh, economic impact of the rules in your country? So the first question is, you know, are there entities that belong to multinational groups that are in scope of Pillar 2 uh, present in your country? And do they do these entities have, have effective tax rates under 15%? And so that's the first question to ask. And it's not necessarily easy to answer. We, we'll see it in a second. But that's very important to do because that will determine the types of responses that you might want to engage in and the types of, uh, of policies you want to introduce in your um, domestic tax legislation. Because if there, is a, if there is an impact of GLOBE in your country, if there are multinational companies with effective tax rate below 15%, and you do not make any uh, adjustment to how these multinationals are taxed, then another country will eventually collect that revenue. Uh, and so if, but if, so the, the, the options that you have at your disposal all aim to raise the effective tax rate at at least 15% so that you increase revenue collection at source um, and you don't let other countries tax this, um, this income that, that has a um, effective tax rate below 15%. So it's a very uh, simple equation. And I think that we're seeing a lot of countries um, this year realizing how it's going to affect them. And this is why um, Zach was saying the qualified domestic minimum tax is getting very popular because it's, as we'll see, it's probably the, the, the most straightforward way to avoid um, having having effective tax rate under 15% domestically. Um, so in terms of, um, so the first step I was saying is to do some kind of economic analysis of what is the potential impact of the minimum tax in your country. And the, in the next slide, we mentioned a few you know, general studies that have been done, like economic impact assessment of Pillar 2. And these already give an order of magnitude of the revenue at stake. Uh, here you have, you have a, a table from the, um, a paper by the EU Tax Observatory. The OECD also published economic ass impact assessments for Pillar 2. Uh, their, first, uh, their first estimate was for 150 billion US dollars per year globally. In, them, in top of tax that would then be captured by, by different countries depending on the rules that they adopt. And then they published a revised estimate earlier this year based on newer data, um, which amounts to two, $250 billion. So, so, so quite a bit more. 
And, but we have to remember that these, these assessments are useful to like get a broad overview of what the impact might be, but they, they use country level data. So the, the income of multinational companies at the country level. So the effective tax rate is basically calculated at the country level and not at the entity level, which might, be, which might make a big difference because in each country you could have some multinational entities um, tax way higher than 15% um, and others way below. And so if you, if you use the, the average of all of that, it could be an effective tax rate that's uh, above 15%, even though if you look in detail, you might see that some companies actually have uh, effective tax rate below, below 15% and therefore would be subject to one of the rules of, of pillar two. So that's why it's important to not just rely on general estimates. Uh, these are useful, but they, for a specific country to do its own uh, assessment and take uh, the required steps as a result, it's important to do a specific analysis at the country level. And so on the next slide, we do provide um, uh, a bit of a checklist in the guide of, of how to do this. It's important to look at uh, all the taxpayers in the country, the large taxpayers, identify which ones are part of multinational groups, and then identify that whether these multinational groups are in scope of pillar two or not. And who is in scope of pillar two? It's all multinational companies that have annual global turnover um, above 750 million euros. And this is based on, it has to be above that threshold for four years. And that threshold has been chosen because it's the same threshold above which multinational companies have to submit country by country reports. Um, it's important because those reports will be useful in calculating the effective tax rate of those, um, of those companies. So once you've identified the companies, you know whether they're in scope, um, you should be able to, to compute the effective tax rate in your jurisdiction of all the entities of that same company in your jurisdiction. So looking at, you need to use, yeah, country by country reports are a good start, uh, but you will, because global rules are not exactly based on the same data as the country by country reports, you also need um, um, your domestic tax returns to, to be able to make some adjustments to elements of the, of the globe income. In particular, I want the use of um, um, depreciations and, and other types of, uh, of differences between local tax rules and, um, and global accounting rules. So that's, that's requires quite a bit of analysis. Uh, I think some countries are already starting to do this, but we'll get into this uh, in the discussion after the, after the presentation. Um, so on the next slide, that's where once you've done the assessment and do, then you can, there are different options available to, to countries uh, in terms of responses. <clears throat> there are three main responses as, you know, as per our guide. The first one is installing a domestic minimum tax. And there are two versions of it. The second option is uh, revising, reviewing, uh, revisiting tax incentives that may cause low effective tax rates. And the third option is, you know, not doing anything if the assessment is that there's not much at stake in your country, and maybe spend the resources into other priorities, at least in the short term. I can detail a little bit the first two options, and, and then we'll we'll we can get back to it in the discussion. In terms of the first option, um, we've talked so far about the qualified domestic minimum tax. So this is the pillar two sanction, you know, officially recognized uh, of qualified domestic minimum tax. It uses the same, um, it adopts the same approach as you know, the rest of pillar two. So it's very consistent with the other rules. And that ensures that if you adopt a qualified domestic minimum tax, there is no double taxation because whatever you uh, capture that source will be recognized in other countries and they won't be able to use the, they won't, their income inclusion rule won't be able to capture the um, top of tax that's already captured by the qualified domestic uh, minimum tax. So this is the, the safest in terms of adaptation with the rest of the, of the globe rules. Uh, but some, some countries are saying it's, it can be quite complicated. You know, it requires adopting the whole package. And so there's, there's an alternative option, which is to implement a domestic minimum tax that's maybe a bit simplified compared to a qualified domestic minimum tax. So it wouldn't be recognized as a full um, pillar two uh, sanction rule, but it would still achieve the same effect of increasing the effective tax rate in your country. And that means uh, that would be considered uh, a covered tax under pillar two. And so there wouldn't be any, um, and so there wouldn't be, um, there would still be no reason for another country to capture 
uh, some top up tax from your country. If you're able to raise the effective tax rates the way you're doing it. There are some risks with it, especially if, because then you might capture more income that's planned by field two, or you might cover more taxpayers than the ones that are in scope. So there might be some uh, frictions there, and that's something to look at in, in detail if you're, if you're considering um, one of these rules, uh, this, this particular uh, generalized domestic minimum tax. Um, and then the, the second option, um, I think we're sharing slides. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I think the slides aren't switching. Okay. I mean, I'm on slide 15 um, with the three options. Uh, I think I forgot to say next slide. Um, slide 15 with the three options uh, in terms of uh, domestic responses. Um, and yeah. I'm actually. I'm actually moving to the next slide now uh, around the revis revisiting incentives. So that's something uh, we go through also in the guide in terms of that's probably not necessarily like an alternative to a qualified domestic minimum tax or, or domestic minimum tax. It could be probably something to do in parallel uh, because one of the main reasons that many countries have um, effective tax rate under 15% is because of tax incentives. A lot of countries have nominal effective tax rates. You know, in terms of tax law, they have a nominal tax rate that's above 15%. It could be 20, 25, 30, 35 in some cases. And that, if you see that, you assume that every company in your country is actually taxed way above the minimum. But if you look in detail, then you see that a lot of countries offer specific tax incentives, uh, such as tax holidays in particular, that exempt income for some companies for a number of years, maybe for five years, 10 years, maybe permanently, uh, or maybe that's limited to an um, export processing zone or any other special, special economic zones. And companies in those zones might benefit from a very generous um, fiscal regime that's, that's different from the uh, headline um, income tax rate. So that means that the, in many countries, the cause of low effective tax rate and the cause of potential top-up tax in the period two, it, um, it's uh, tax incentives. So revisiting tax incentives is actually a logical conclusion of the implementation of the global minimum tax for many countries. It's to look at the tax incentives that are offered to investors and rethink how they fare under pillar two. And many of them don't fare very well, especially the ones that exempt income altogether. So we make a difference between profit-based tax incentives that probably many of them needs to be re revisited and then cost-based incentives um, such as accelerated depreciation and investment credits, those can probably still be used effectively, especially taking on the substance-based income exclusion of the rules. So it's going to be a, a very detailed work in every country to understand which incentive needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be removed and 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 revisited. Uh, but it's an important one to do, uh, and I think you know several organizations are, are doing it as we hear in the discussions. Um, Thanks a lot. I'm now going to move to the third part. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Kudzai uh, to talk about some of the risks in doing in doing this uh, taking these approaches. Thank you for that very detailed explanation, Tama. In the final uh, section of the presentation, we will go through the potential legal barriers to adaptation responses, as discussed by Tama in the previous section. The first legal constraint that we contemplate in the guide is the uh, constraint that emanates from the possible interaction of stabilization clauses held either in investment laws or in specific contracts or in broader domestic laws and changes to the domestic tax regime. Stabilization clauses can broadly be understood as clauses that in their aim strive to freeze in time the fiscal conditions that are applicable to investors. And these sort of clauses vary in duration with some being indefinite and others being held only for specific times. They also vary in terms of which specific taxes they apply to. And for this reason, it is, conclusive, it is difficult to make a conclusive adjudication as to whether or not stabilization clauses will stand as a legal barrier to adaptation policies. And what we encourage in the guide is for countries to take a very case-by-case uh, -case analysis of the stabilization clauses that they that they give out in contracts or in the domestic regime, and to assess, first of all, the taxes that are implicated, the duration of specific stabilization clauses. And we flag this to be a risk, particularly because investment arbitration of investment arbitrators have tended to take very black letter 
um, interpretations of stabilization clauses, often reading them in a very narrow and rigid way, which has in many investment claims led to countries being found to be in contravention of these clauses. We go on to contemplate what countries can do to anticipate or to prevent any legal challenges that may emanate from stabilization clauses, with the first being that countries may seek uh, companies affected by these reforms to make unilateral declarations that as a result of the operation of the rules, the taxes that are being, um, are being impounded on them in the domestic regime will not result in damages overall because they would be payable elsewhere if they were not payable in the investment host state. Uh, this is the first and probably the most pragmatic approach that countries can take. And a second approach that we contemplate is that of renegotiation of stabilization clauses. But this we propose very cautiously due to the various risks of opening contracts to renegotiation. Often countries may not be fully aware of the overall impact that opening up a contract may have on other provisions in the, in the contract. And so this should be taken almost as an option of last resort. On the next slide, we, we contemplate the potential interaction of investment treaties or investment contracts more broadly and any potential changes to domestic legislation. And we, in various ways, uh, examine the potential impact of expropriation clauses, most favored nation, fair and equitable treatment, uh, and other non-discrimination clauses on a very broad and high level due to the very specific nature that these standards of treatment can present themselves in investment contracts. What we do find, however, is that the most, uh, the most notable standard of treatment would be that of fair and equitable treatment. This treat the standard of treatment in its, es in its essence strives to make sure that uh, investment or in companies are subject to the most equitable manner of treatment in a the way that laws apply to them and that they face any unfair discrimination beyond which, what that which they could have expected at the time of their investment. Fair and equitable treatment often interacts in a very direct manner with the legitimate expectations of an investor. And sometimes this can be construed to mean that an investor is can reliably infer that the conditions, the fiscal conditions under which he made the investment will not change in time. The combination of these two standards of treatment being the fair and equitable treatment and the illegitimate expectations of an investor tend to, to turbocharge stabilization clauses where they exist. And so there's also necessity for countries to look at the interaction between both stabilization clauses and the fair and equitable treatment in investment contracts or treaties more broadly. What we encourage countries to do in our guidance is to A, be very cautious in the way that they implement any possible reforms to the domestic regime. Particularly, we encourage countries to make sure that they adhere to the normal legislative process, which includes having fair consultation processes and not implementing the law itself in an arbitrary manner. We also discourage countries from using response mechanisms to GLOBE as a manner through which to discriminate unfairly between investors in like circumstances. For example, any possible response mechanism should apply equally to all investors who meet the threshold of the GLOBE rules and cannot be targeted to um, investments in particular sectors or of, of particular nationalities. Once again, we cautiously uh, propose that countries could renegotiate the most problematic standards of treatment. And these tend to be standards of treatment that come from all the generation investment treaties, which are due and ready for uh, updating in any event. And the global minimum tax could provide the, the impetuous for countries to begin on these sort of reforms. And then lastly, we caution countries to Take closer look at to take a closer look at the carve out of tax in their investment treaties, as various studies, including studies by UNCTAD, have shown that carve outs are not a definitive way to make sure that tax related claims are left out of the ambit of international investment arbitration clauses. And often, uh, tax is not brought as a direct matter to arbitration bodies, but the causes of claim tend to emanate from separate issues and then taxes 
almost compounding the investor's grievances. I think in a nutshell, these are the main legal challenges we contemplate, and this brings us to the end of the section of the presentation and also brings us to the end of the, the guide. Thank you very much, Kudzi, Tomar, and Zach for taking us through the guide. Um, hopefully you all agree that it's a useful resource. Uh, we tried to keep it as, as simple and succinct as possible, which is uh, not the easiest of tasks uh, when it comes to these reforms, but uh, we do hope that it, it's easy for um, particularly policymakers to digest. And I know that later on we'll talk about the support that ISD, ISLP, are looking to provide countries together with our partners uh, joining us, um, OECD, SEAT, World Bank, and so on. Um, before we move to our panelists, I'd like to just put a couple of clarifying questions to uh, Zach uh, and Kudzi in particular. So Zach, there's a question from 4chap in the Q&A, which is how can the constituent entity have knowledge of the fact that the top up tax has not been collected since they are not directly in the chain of income? So if you could just think about that for a moment and then Kudzi, I'd like you to just elaborate a little bit on the, the interaction between pillar two and stabilization. So I know you've, you've spoken about that already um, in your presentation, but if there's anything that you missed that you'd like to add um, for, for Jose in the Q&A. And then Joe, uh, thank you for your question on capacity building and support to countries. I think we'll come back to that and, and our panelists are gonna speak a little bit about what's being done on their side. And, and I know we'll, we'll talk about that more in the Q&A later on. So Zach, can I throw to you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And thanks for sure for that. Um, I think the problem of information, of knowledge of what's happening, especially within the big groups, is a, true, a real one. And I would love for Andrew to jump in at some point. But I think there is a mechanism. As long as you know the parent entity is located in a country that has adopted Pillar 2, the parent entity has an obligation to, uh, to apply the income inclusion rule and top up the tax. Right, so there is an obligation from the parent company or from the parent company to pay the income inclusion role to the parent entity jurisdiction as long as they have implemented the uh, globe rules or the pillar two rules. And if they have not, then you know you're not getting your income inclusion role at the parent level. And if the local country has adopted the QDMTT, actually, even if they have uh, for income inclusion, that will come first. But then that's where you get into the um, other tax profits role and et cetera. But there's also the reporting that is done at the level of the parent entity that has to be shared at the level of the local jurisdiction as well. That may allow you to, to know exactly that the top of tax has been paid. But really before you get into the reporting or uh, the tax information exchange of the tax return, you should rest, uh, be comfortable with the fact that as long as the parent entity is located in a jurisdiction that has adopted the globe rules. And I think it is known to everyone who has or who has not adopted the globe rules, you should um, rest assured that the top of tax has been applied at the parent level. Brilliant. Thank you, Zach. Kudzi. Thank you for that question. Um, I think in answering the question, uh, the first thing I'll say is whether or not stabilization clauses will impact, will be, you will contravene pillar two. The most straightforward answers, unfortunately, it depends because a certain number of circumstances must all occur at the same time for an investor to, as a starting point, have a claim. So you'd have to have an in scope company, you'd have to have a stabilization clause that is still applicable, so it wasn't limited to a specific time. You would have to be sure that the taxes that have been amended in the domestic regime are also in scope of the stabilization clause. And there, there is a big chance if all of those conditions are met that there is a contravention of the stabilization clause. However, the pure contravention of the stabilization clause gives an investor a claim. However, it is not, we don't anticipate it to be a very strong claim because when that matter is brought before a tribunal, the investor would still have to prove that this contravention of the stabilization clause has caused him damage. However, as the architecture of the rules are set, if a tax is not paid within country A and another country applies either UTPR or an IIR, income inclusion rule or a profit rule, that same amount is payable and by that same tax pay in foreign jurisdiction. And so a domestic change in tax that makes the 
the tax payable in country A cannot be found to be damage causing because the tax is payable in due in any event. So an investor could bring a claim, but not a very strong claim in our opinion. So whether or not pillar two in itself just by its operation contravenes stabilization clause, we need, as I mentioned earlier, very case by case analysis, the in scope of the, the scope of the company, the taxes involved, and also the, the investor still has to prove how this change in taxation has caused damage to him. And we fail, we fail to contemplate how this could be possible. Uh, Ali, please feel free to add if you missed anything, but that's what I'll say in summary. No, that's perfect. Thank you, Kutsi. Um, we, we've got a, another question. Uh, thank you, uh, Kuldeep. We'll come to that in a moment, but um, I'd like to turn now to our first panelist. So, Anarella Calderoni. Uh, Anarella is a certified financial planner with a master's degree in international and European tax law from Maastricht. And she's been working as an analyst on international tax and transfer pricing policy at the Inter-American Center for Tax Administration, SEAT, for five years. So Anarella, uh, over to you. We have a question, um, which you may or may not already be aware of. Uh, so SEAT works with tax administrations in 42 member countries with a focus on Latin America. How are they reacting to or adapting to GLOBE? Over to you. All right, thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, okay, so... The information that we have is on our Latin American countries. As you said, we have 42 countries ranging uh, Europe, Africa, et cetera, but specifically focusing on Latin America. Uh, we have the information that's on the screen. Thank you very much. Um, it's on all of Latin America and one Caribbean country, which is Dominican Republic. Now in Latin America, there are seven countries which are not inclusive framework um, members, which means that they don't actually need to implement uh, BEPS or the pillar recommendations if they don't want to. However, some of these countries have in the past implemented some BEPS actions, even if not part of the inclusive framework on BEPS or from the OECD. So this could happen also with pillar two, especially due to the functioning that uh, Tomas and everyone just explained in the international political pressure. Now, for the 12 countries in Latin America that our uh, inclusive framework members. Uh, we can see in this graph, the top part of the graph, um, everything that's in green with a little one means that there's been some action there. So all of the countries uh, have started learning uh, about the proposed rules and what to do about it. Uh, four of them have reported that they've started sensibilization actions, so meetings with Chamber of Commerce, large companies, discussions to receive feedback and try to maintain some sort of tax certainty, uh, especially for the future since there's lots of unknowns. Then 11 countries have uh, started assessing the impact that this these rules could have on their economic sectors. And 10 countries have cr actually created a unit of designated officials from either Ministry of Finance, Tax Administration, or both within um, government to evaluate and coordinate the adaptation of, these, of their legislation and what potential changes would need to be um, made to their legislation. Lastly, there's only one country that has officially adopted part of pillar two, which is the qualified domestic minimum top up tax. However, um, the calculation, the way that they've chosen to calculate this does not necessarily align to the latest version of the model rules by the OECD. So uh, Colombia is currently analyzing how to modify what they've adopted to better align it to the internationally proposed practices. Um, and then there is no further work being done on the rest of the rules, the IIR, et cetera. So uh, in general, I think the, the um, is there, sorry, I'm looking at messages. No, is no, there, it's okay. It was just, um, I think I the English slides, um, hopefully they're put up by now, your data, Anarela, because um, it wasn't coming oh, it wasn't the there. English channel. But it's okay, I can see it on the, the other channels. So okay. thank you. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, pretty much um, one country has adopted the QDMTT, and there's no other countries that have officially adopted any of the Pillar 2 rules so far. So to summarize, um, Latin America is still very much in the initial stages 
of this process, um, the planning, the coordinating, the simple understanding of these rules, which is actually not so simple. <laughs> um, but it's it's a lot to take in. However, I think that this guide that we've presented is going to be very useful for the region, especially for um, analyzing the impact in the uh, the functioning of these rules. So thank you for the guide, and I will be sure to share it with our member countries as much as possible. And I guess that's it for... Thanks, Anna Anarilla. That's really helpful. Uh, it's really interesting to see the response and take up so far. As you say, it's still early days, um, I think, for, for most regions. Uh, and we're keen to help play a role in Latin America and, and helping countries to better understand the rules and what their options are uh, together with partners. So thank you very much for being with us and for your contribution. Um, I'd like to invite now uh, Claudia Vargas Pastor, uh, who's a public sector specialist at the World Bank uh, within the fiscal policy unit of the World Bank's macroeconomics, trade and investment global practice. Claudia joined the bank seven years ago and her work focuses on technical assistance to developing countries, including diagnostic assessments on tax policy, international tax issues, and tax transparency standards in several regions, but mainly Latin America as well. And prior to that, she was uh, with EY in the US and Peru, and also briefly with uh, the Peruvian Tax Administration, SUNAT. Uh, and she holds a law degree from Peru and an LLM from Georgetown. So uh, Claudia, thank you for being with us. And we know that you're very active in this area um, together with the OECD and other partners. And our question to you is, uh, we understand that the World Bank offers capacity building and technical assistance on the impact of pillar two to a number of developing countries. What are the major challenges for developing countries regarding implementation of the global minimum tax? You have the okay. floor. Thank you, thank you, Ali. Uh, and thank you also for, for the invitation to, to this panel and the organization of this event. I think it's very, very important uh, right now, like uh, it's, 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 it's a momentum. Um, yeah, we at the World Bank uh, recognize that the implementation of the GMT is a pressing issue for many developing countries. And, and as part of our international tax agenda that, that we're working on, uh, we have been assisting some countries already on bilateral basis and also through uh, regional events on this issue since, since late uh, 2021. Uh, we feel that the nature of the GMT is like there are options, as, as you mentioned, like for countries to uh, implement in the GMT, and, and they will need to determine what is the optimal depending on the circumstances. But but also they need information, you know. Like uh, we also prepare a report uh, that yeah that, that also you cited in your guidance that is like kind of in in line with with your guidelines and include these type of first uh, looking at the measure to protect the, the tax base, no? which is including the, the, the MTT and review tax incentives. Uh, and also implementation, looking at if it's important to implement GLOBE rules or not, like the whole package of IAR and UTPR rules. And also looking at broader reform options, including a deeper reform on corporate tax policy or optimizing tax incentives uh, under this new environment. A simplification also of corporate tax regimes. Uh, so um, developing countries should look at these options, uh, uh, but they will need information. And we've seen that many low and middle income countries that some of them maybe are inclusive framework members don't have the administrative capacity to manage uh, uh, some of the more complex parameters and their consideration. For example, carve out thresholds for applying the new rules, formulas to estimate tax and base allocation, um, capacity to, to look at defective tax rates, uh, just to enumerate uh, some of, uh, of these aspects. Uh, and in addition uh, of understanding uh, the actual rules, we have identified some of other challenges, for example, uh, how they use the data when they don't have TVCR data. No? So the, the reliance on tax administration is, is data is of essence, but they need to also know how to look at it to, to, to kind of identify in the scope businesses. Uh, secondly, uh, also analyzing the existing tax incentives in the context of the model rules. Uh, I mean, compatibility of the incentives with the GMT and how this can be uh, recalibrated to incentivize jobs and investments. So look, at, look beyond tax incentives that attract uh, actual uh, FDIs. No, um, 
uh, because the, the, the landscape of, of invent is in investment in general should look at uh, how they can improve the business environment, the political stability, labor markets, education infrastructure that make the, the jurisdiction more attractive uh, for investors. And it's not only like looking at the tax incentive itself. Uh, other thing that we've seen is like the practical implementation steps, you know, like they, they, they have face some challenges when facing with a consultation with businesses. So uh, they need to, to, to kind of develop a implementation roadmap to, 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 to try to bring together uh, all the stakeholders in this aspect. Also challenges on drafting the legislation itself to see if they're gonna be uh, GMT compliant or will gonna pass the peer review uh, later on. And, and also uh, like finally maybe managing the transition, you know, like uh, for example, in particular uh, with these stabilization clauses, you know, that how they will, they will manage it. So, so are they re renegotiated them? Are they waiting until they expire? So uh, there are things to, to consider that I think information is, is basic. So we are the bank are ready to support uh, all developing countries that decide to implement the GMT. Uh, some areas we can be of, any, of assistance, we have been providing uh, capacity buildings to tax officials. Uh, so detailed uh, training on the GMT rules through workshops, also uh, give the information that they make a, a, a decision uh, of, of implementation, you know, uh, and also looking at identifying in scope corporations, calculate the ETRs, estimate the revenue impact, and also the revenue loss if they don't implement the, 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 the QDMTT. Uh, and, and, and yeah, we, we are really happy to, to join forces with uh, the other partners and international organizations to make it uh, simpler uh, for for the for the developing countries. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claudia. And we'll come back to you in the Q and A. I have a, another question that I'd like to ask you. But before we get there, um, we need to turn over to our colleagues from the OECD. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Andrew Auerbach, who's a senior tax advisor, uh, and Jessica DeVries, from, uh, who's an advisor at the OECD. So Andrew is a senior tax advisor at the OECD at the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration, and he's been primarily responsible for BEPS implementation in the Global Relations and Development Division. So Andrew, you've um, been here before with the rollout of the BEPS actions. Um, so Andrew is Canadian by background and a, and a tax lawyer. Um, so we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you for making time and thanks for your um, feedback on the guide as we've gone along. And Jessica, so as I mentioned, Jessica is also an advisor within the OECD CTPA, specifically on Pillar 2. Uh, and she joined the OECD six years ago and has been working on several BEPS action items, including harmful tax practices, uh, and also Pillar 1 for your sins, Jessica. And prior to joining the OECD, she was an auditor with the Dutch Tax Administration. So thank you for both being here. Uh, and I turn it over to, to the two of you to um, make your contribution. Okay, th thanks, Ali, and, and and thanks to to IASD and ISLP uh, for uh, for for inviting us and uh, uh, and for the uh, for the guide uh, most importantly for the for the handbook because I think it's a really valuable uh, contribution um, uh, in an area where where indeed there's a lot of demand for assistance and 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 a lot of questions and and it's a very good product so 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 very happy uh, for that. Uh, and and would also like to to echo uh, Claudia's uh, you, you know remarks about uh, about the work they're doing in collaboration with other uh, international organizations. There's a lot of uh, contributors to this space. Um, you know, not just World Bank. We have uh, Ciat, uh, of course, as well here, but IMF, ADB, ATAF in Africa, uh, all contributing. And and uh, indeed, this is happening, and and countries are reacting, and 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 they do need assistance. I noticed the. Uh, question in the chat about uh, training tax administrators, and and indeed that's that's a, a big push from us. We have a lot of material that we're developing uh, online on our uh, uh, knowledge sharing platform that's available to tax you know tax administrations around the world, whether they're you know members of the inclusive framework or not. Um, and and we have a number of modules on on calculating uh, you know the the, the globe uh, tax and and the various steps involved. Also doing a lot of bilateral work there. Um, 
a big part of this is going to be a collaboration and, and cooperation uh, is going to be important uh, because there are a lot of people uh, in the space and, and we need to be effective and, and, and make sure that we're not kind of duplicating efforts, but we're also kind of working to each other's strengths. Uh, a key issue will be uh, the, 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 the peer review uh, aspect of this. I mean, Zach uh, kind of broke down the rules and of course they're interlocking um, and the rules in one country rely on, on, on rules in another country and how they, how they operate together. Uh, and so indeed um, the OECD and the inclusive framework has a process for that. So I think uh, I'll turn to, to Jessica, who's the, the expert in terms of the, 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 the pillar two and the globe rules to explain a little bit about the peer review process. Maybe Jessica, while you're at it, you can touch on, on the globe information return. Cause I know that was also a question about sort of the, 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 the information that people have here. And, um, and and how to you know make sure these rules are being applied consistently across a lot of a lot of jurisdictions. So uh, Jessica, thanks and and hello everybody. Um, thank you to to IASD for inviting us. Indeed, um, I will talk briefly about the peer review that we're currently um, designing. So we need a peer review um, because only the rule order, as Zach described, it only applies uh, when rules are qualified. So in the rule order, the QDMTT, so qualified domestic minimum top-up tax comes first, then the income inclusion rule, and then the UTPR. Um, but in order for that rule order to apply, um, the rules need to be qualified. What does it mean when rules are qualified? It means that there should be equivalent legislation. And it also means that the legislation is implemented and administered in a way uh, that is consistent with the outcomes that is provided under the GLOBE rules. And so the GLOBE rules are the model rules that we have published. Um, we have published commentary, and we are also publishing administrative guidance. We have published the first trench in February, and we will um, publish more administrative guidance soon. Equivalent legislation means that the rules do not necessarily have to be exactly the same as we have in the model rules, um, but there, it needs to give like an equivalent outcome. We think it's good if countries refer to the model rules. Um, so we've seen that some countries, um, including for example, Switzerland and New Zealand, they are actually referring directly to the model rules, um, which we think is, is really good because if then we, we introduce new administrative guidance, you immediately have a reference to that. Um, but we also see that other countries, they have translated uh, the model rules into their own domestic legislation. So we see that, for example, with the EU directive, but also with legislation from the UK. An important element of implementation and administration is that the rules cannot provide benefits, uh, sorry, that a country cannot provide benefits that are directly related uh, to the tax that is collected with a QDMTT, an IR or a UTPR. And this is something that we will review as part of our ongoing monitoring process. So the peer review will consist of a legislative review and of ongoing monitoring where we look at countries' administration um, and implementation. So then briefly, very short on what we envisage to do with the legislative review. Um, so we're currently within the inclusive framework developing the terms of reference and the methodology for the peer review. And we expect that the peer review will commence in the second half of the year because there are already many countries in the process of implementing the rules um, and they will implement as of next year, as of 2024. So it's important for us to have that process in place um, that gives both countries and also m and &E certainty uh, about whose country's rules are qualified. Um, since that's a very short time frame, uh, the inclusive framework is currently discussing whether the legislative review should consist of a transitional uh, review and of a full legislative review. Um, the transitional review uh, being for the for um, the time being, um, an assessment of a country's uh, legislation as qualified. And then at the same time, a full legislative review will start. Um, and that will take probably several months, maybe sometimes even years uh, for that to be, to be finalized. Um, then um, very briefly on the GLOBE information return. So we're currently, 
um, in the, the middle of like um, our June deliverables, as we say it, like we have an inclusive framework meeting uh, mid July, and we want to, we will, uh, after that inclusive framework meeting, release some um, additional um, documents, hopefully including the, the globe information return. So that's a tax return, a standardized tax return um, that we have also agreed to in the in the model rules. Uh, that needs to be filed uh, in, in principle in each jurisdiction um, in which top up tax uh, will be collected. So each jurisdiction that is in scope, um, unless there are exchange mechanisms available uh, between uh, the headquarter jurisdiction and other jurisdiction where the where the M &E operation. So we had a public consultation on the, the globe information return that will collect um, a lot of data uh, items from the M&E groups, and we will hope to, to release that, that shortly. So I'll stop here. Jessica, Andrew, thank you very much. Um, it's really helpful. And I'd like to ask you, Jessica, one question, um, if I may, um, that's come up in the chat, which I think is relevant to um, what you've just, just described, and it's how it's, it's dealing with this issue of the alternative minimum tax. So you spoke about Switzerland and New Zealand having followed very closely the, the GLOBE rules and the, the um, suggested drafting that you've provided, but um, what about, you know, this idea around an alternative minimum tax where there is a little bit of deviation from the approach that's been suggested? Um, what's you know, what's the OECD's position in relation to that? How are you working with countries that are exploring, you know, adjustments um, to your suggested approach? Right, so thanks for that question. And well, I mean, I guess it's, it, it depends. So if a country implements, if a country, for example, uh, increases its corporate income tax rate or it implements a corporate income tax, um, then a corporate income tax is a covered tax. Uh, covered tax is, as SEC described, uh, necessary to, um, to calculate the effective tax rate. Um, a QDMTT, so a domestic minimum top of tax that is qualified, um, is not a covered tax. A QDMTT is a deduction to uh, the top of tax that is li li liable in a jurisdiction. Um, we currently, we expect that domestic minimum top of tax will be qualified. Um, so we haven't had the chance to peer review the ATOF uh, guide, for example, or we haven't had the chance to peer review a New Zealand's legislation, even if, if they refer directly to the model rules, we expect it to be a, a qualified domestic minimum top of tax. If a domestic minimum top of tax, top of tax sorry, is not a qualified one, uh, then it will not cannot be deducted from the top of tax. So this is why we also find it really important um, to speak to jurisdictions and to provide them with technical uh, assistance at a very early stage when they start uh, drafting their legislation. So I hope that was clear. Yeah, that was. Uh, if I just quickly, just to make sure Thanks. that it, it is it is clear, I'm just put a button on it for for one second. So you're saying if the peer review process, or if it is determined that you fall short of the qualification as a qualified domestic minimum tax, we countries here can safely assume that you will have no issue compute having that in your computation of your ACR as a covered tax. Sorry, can you just repeat it? I, I didn't fully follow. I'm really sorry. No, sorry. Um, I was saying just to put a button on it, right? We have a number of countries here, and I know that's a question that has come up. If the determination has been made that you do not qualify as a QDMTT, the countries here should be comfortable with themselves saying that a minimum tax that I have, a minimum tax that I have um, implemented, will have no issue being taken into account in my global ETR computation as a covered tax. Well, like it's it's a good comment and a good question. So, in order, um, so a, a covered tax is a corporate income tax or one that is in lieu of a corporate income tax, and so it's it's in principle countries their own assessment to to assess what is a covered tax. Um, for now, we do not not envisage that to be included in the peer review, but the, the inclusive framework may. Um, decide at a later stage in its ongoing monitoring process if it will also review um, countries' uh, uh, definition of cover taxes. So th that's all I, I can say on that at this stage. Okay, thank you. Thanks.
Thanks, Jessica, and thanks, thanks Zach, for asking the tough questions. <laughs> um, appreciate it. And now I'd like to invite our ISD colleague, uh, Ron uh, Tundang, who's from the ISD Investment Law and Policy Team. So I mentioned that um, our work on the global minimum tax is a collaboration before, between our tax program and our investment law and policy program. Uh, Ron is with that program based in Indonesia. Um, Ron's a practicing lawyer uh, based in Jakarta. He's got a number of years experience working with governments and international organizations on trade and investment law. Uh, with ISD, he assists uh, the ASEAN member states in promoting responsible investment in food, agriculture and forestry, uh, and also provides advisory support to the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly. Uh, and prior to that, he was a diplomat working with um, the Indonesian Embassy in Washington. So as I mentioned, Ron uh, sits with our investment team and is very plugged into uh, the response to the global minimum tax in the Asia Pacific region. And um, not only how countries are responding in terms of exploring implementation of GLOBE, but also looking at uh, potential workarounds as well, which I think is, you know, an issue that we're all grappling, grappling with is, you know, what's the new face of tax competition uh, potentially post globe. So, Ron, can I ask you um, to to share your thoughts specifically on, um, as I said, you work on investment promotion with ASEAN member states in the agriculture sector. What should investment practitioners know about Pillar 2 and how might it impact that work? So their work. So we have through our networks tried to reach out to people working on investment and I'm sure that there, some of them will be with us today in this webinar. So uh, what's your message to them to make sure that they're looped into these changes that are uh, lie ahead? Thank you very much, Ali, for the opportunity and also the very good questions that you have prepared. I'll just start kick into the uh, first question. And what should investment officials, particularly in developing countries, know about Pillar 2 um, and how this might impact the work? I think it's pretty clear uh, the globe or the global minimum tax rules will. There is a possibility uh, that it would might discourage investment in developing countries because MNEs would uh, certainly no longer receive no fiscal incentives out of their investment due to the minimum tax. Uh, these rules would severely affect uh, tax incentive associated with um, investment provided by developing countries' government. Uh, based on our experience, my own experience, um, particularly developing countries' government uh, tend to give a lot of tax holidays and exemptions um, with a purpose to attract or increase more uh, foreign direct investment to the country. And I think developing countries uh, should be aware of this, should restructure the country's investment policies to fit with the new uh, global minimum tax landscape. Uh, hopefully this will preserve the benefit of tax incentive while uh, maintaining um, compliance with the new rules. And I would see based on my interaction uh, with investment officials, there are two uh, solutions that countries are considering, including Indonesia where I'm based. I think the first that I would like to touch because a lot of things have been uh, discussed regarding fiscal uh, incentive. What I would uh, discuss a bit right now is non-fiscal incentive that government in developing countries can consider to respond to the GMT or GLOBE rules. One of the option here is actually to provide subsidy, uh, which is legal still under the WTO agreements on critical infrastructure or projects essential for developing countries. Because we see uh, infrastructure projects are uh, key elements in country, developing countries' development. And hence, I, it is very beneficial that investment uh, really plays a very important role to achieve or realize uh, and to address infra infrastructure gaps within the country. So subsidy can be provided um, in the form of cash or cash equivalent by the government for infrastructure projects that are beneficial to public services. Hopefully this um, will also entails more investment coming in because with a good infrastructure, it in itself, it serves as a reason for investors to invest. An example of a subsidy, I will just take a cue from developed countries, uh, is the UK Guarantee Scheme, which was designed to kickstart crucial infrastructure projects. Uh, UK offered like 40 billion uh, of answering guarantees in aggregate, regardless of the project performance. It resulted in more than 6,000 investment projects in five years, created more than 200,000 jobs, and generated roughly around 24 billion of answering investment. So this 
kind of incentive uh, we usually try to encourage countries to consider um, in crafting their uh, subsidy policies. So they would be uh, that will, this will enable them to increase their own industrial capacity itself and to close that development gap. And I just want to uh, touch a bit upon the uh, fiscal incentive that countries might still consider, although there are global minimum tax rules that currently be put in place. I think first and foremost, uh, we know exactly that the global minimum tax pertain to a specific category of tax, but there are other categories of tax that uh, developing countries can still consider. I think first um, step is probably to see whether um, some quick wins like uh, considering accelerated depreciation or loss carry forward method to assess tax incentive can be taken as an approach by developing countries. This is something that Indonesia is considering at the moment. And the second step is probably to look into like a refundable tax credit scheme uh, where you, you design a requirement that will be beneficial for your own developmental needs. And I think in particular for developing countries, uh, research and development is one key element where they need to fill in to close the development gap and of particular importance, uh, providing incentive for having foreign investors conduct research and development in the country is very essential. Again, I'll take another example from United Kingdom. Uh, the United Kingdom R&D expenditure credit is kind of a form of like a tax relief that meets the definition of uh, refundable tax credit. And introducing this kind of incentive would uh, not only benefits the investors that are uh, investing in the country, but also increase the capacity of local uh, resources and workforces. I think this is um, something that I think we try to advise uh, a lot of countries where we work with. And I think the, the last one, which uh, has been also essential is to look into domestic taxes. Um, we know exactly that the global minimum tax, particularly targeting multinational enterprises. And a lot of these multinational enterprises, uh, they also pay taxes, but not only their own taxes, but also value added taxes or um, payroll tax rate. This is something that developing countries can still play where there is a flexibility in terms of um, generating or developing uh, new incentive measures. So I think these are some key points that uh, I've, I've taken from my conversation and our interaction. And I'm hoping that this, this can be helpful and also can uh, move forward and advance uh, the discussion. And also, by the way, um, Indonesia is one of the key countries in, in implementing Pillar 1. I think they're, they could serve an ex, as an example next year how this is being implemented by an emerging economy. Thanks very much, Ron. Uh, it's really interesting to hear your perspective coming from the investment side. I think um, most of the panelists and I'm sure a number of the people uh, that are joining us for this webinar come at this from a tax perspective very much around, you know, protecting the tax base, increasing revenue, um, domestic revenues. Um, but, it, you know, it's interesting to hear your thoughts on, you know, there's still an imperative to attract foreign direct, direct investment and countries um, you know, rightfully concerned about that and looking for alternative ways to attract investment. Um, I think the key thing is, from my perspective is making sure that then these new ways which countries might compete to attract investment don't um, try and limit the extent to which it undercuts other aspects of the tax base and, and as always, you know, doing it in a you know, efficient, effective manner that's aligned with clear policy goals, transparent and so on. It's going to be very important even in, in granting subsidies and so on. But um, at, at this point, uh, Andrew and Jessica, I'd like to invite you guys to say a few words. There, there are two questions in the chat from Forchap and Omar, and it kind of links to this question, this issue that Ron's just raised around to what extent are, you know, other forms of incentives and so on captured by GLOBE. Um, so the first one is the practice of giving some special allowance for extra expenditure instead of reducing the tax rate. Does the determination of the effective tax rate take such situations into account? And secondly, what are the implications for special economic uh, zones? Yes, I, I can speak on that. And then let's see if Andrew wants to wants to add something um, later. 
Um, so we see that income-based tax incentives are mostly affected, will be mostly affected uh, by GLOBE uh, because they provide for a low or no uh, effective tax rate. So, and then you you will need to pay, m &Es will need to pay a top up tax in that uh, jurisdiction. Um, so uh, for example, in a special economic zone, it's, it's usually an income-based uh, incentive. Um, um, which we think will be impacted uh, by GLOBE. So countries, um, as I think Thomas already explained earlier, they will need to uh, reconsider their, their type of incentives. Um, Expenditure-based incentives will be, be less affected. Uh, so especially if these type of incentives are based on payroll and on tangible assets, because we have a substance-based income inclusion in the GLOBE rules, uh, meaning that the more uh, substance or the more based on payroll and on tangible assets there is in the jurisdiction, the less excess profits will be um, subject to the to the top up tax. Um, we are currently also looking in the into the issue and maybe just to to add to what what Ronald was saying into the issue of um, the qualified refundable uh, tax credits. Um, uh, because like those type of credits, they are allowed under the GLOBE rules because we see them basically as government grants. However, they really need to be a refundable credit. So even if the company was in a loss position, those type of credits uh, would need to be paid. So we, we do think that um, countries would really need to consider whether that is, that is good for, for their policy and if they can maybe have alternative ways to attract uh, foreign uh, investment, maybe indeed more based on, on expenditure or based incentives. Um, I also think that uh, the peer review will um, include a review uh, of those tax credits, whether they are indeed uh, qualified or not, because everything basically that has uh, the definition of qualified in our rules uh, will be will be reviewed. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just stop there to see if, if Andrew wants to wants to add something. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jessica. I mean, I, I think maybe uh, stepping back a bit. I mean, the 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 the, the, the great kind of you know sea change to the international tax world that the that the minimum tax brings is is to really change the conversation on on tax incentives and tax base in a lot of developing countries. And 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 there's a huge uh, pressure uh, to to increase fiscal space and 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 mobilize resources in countries to, to to fund their development to fund infrastructure and, and and ultimately you know i think a lot of the studies that that we've done that that, that others uh you know in the space have done have shown that uh that tax incentives or low taxes you know it, it's it's an incentive to investment but it's not necessarily the you know the number one draw um that there are a lot of considerations that really um, that really come uh, come first for, for for business when they're choosing a, a location to uh, to invest their capital, and and so you know I'd be leery to you know having been able to kind of capture back this this 15% tax base, be so anxious to then you know try and find ways to give it away. I mean I think um, as Thomas mentioned uh, I think you know in, in his presentation you know the QDMTT is something. That, that can that can bring the tax immediately, and then looking at the tax incentives. Well, what makes sense now? And 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 given what M and E's are going to face uh, globally, um, you know what what do we keep and and, and what can be uh, you know what can be paired away? I think is a real good medium term question that uh, that we're working on countries with. You know, Claudia has mentioned as well and others in this space. So. I think it's really it's a it's a new conversation uh, that you know around investment contracts too, quite you know as Kudze mentioned about sort of looking back at what the existing contracts or treaties might do. Looking forward, there's now a new conversation, and I think countries need to kind of adjust to that and and reorient how they uh, how they approach uh, tax policy. Thanks, Andrew. I think you've um concluded this webinar beautifully. I <laughs> appreciate that. And I'd like to pass back to my colleague Enya from ISLB to give us a few remarks before we let you all go for the day. But thank you. I think it's been an interesting conversation and we appreciate um, the collaboration and, and the input of different partners. Anarela, sorry, did you want to say something? 
No, I just, I wasn't sure if maybe I missed it. There is a question about what's being done to train local tax administrations um, for Pillar 2. I don't know if uh, someone from the OECD mentioned that there are five courses on the KSB, uh, which, which kind of take you through the functioning of these rules. And I think, um, yeah, there's also like for us from SEAT side, for our member countries, we're being asked specific questions and um, like just trying to work with countries and whatever they may need to help with, especially like things like this guide are very useful. So just wanted to mention that. No, thanks, Annarella. I, I think I, I felt that we, the OECD, World Bank yourself kind of addressed it in your remarks. There's a lot going on is the answer. I think everyone is sees that there's a huge need to bring, help countries get up, get up to speed since this is coming into force next year. And, you know, if you don't have rules in place, you could very well see a transfer of revenue from, you know, from your country to, you know, the country where the, the parent is located. So, um, I think the answer is a lot. And as we all are doing our best to coordinate and work together, uh, but thank you for pointing out the courses on the KSP and, and doing Andrew and Jess's job for them. So great work. Uh, but anyway, over to you maybe to say a few words on, on what ISD and ISFP are uh, trying to support countries with as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Ali. Happy to uh, speak briefly about our technical assistance program. But first, let me just say very quick, uh, thank you to Thomas, Zach, and Kudzi for the excellent presentation, and to you, Ali, our moderator for today. Uh, thanks also to our panelists for the very robust and uh, insightful uh, contributions. Um, just on the slide, Thomas, I believe you're, you're sharing, everyone can see. From our side, ISLP and ISD, we are now piloting a technical assistance program on the guide and currently reaching out to our various government partners just to also speak to them by the guide and the plan uh, uh, of this proposed implementation support phase that we, we have in mind, we're planning to roll out. Um, we're also now gauging interest. We've had a few uh, meetings already with some interested uh, various government uh, uh, partners and now sort of reaching out again to others to, to gauge their interest. In terms of the technical assistance program we have in mind, it's on your screen here, basically to just also provide some sort of guidance around understanding the rules, uh, providing um, support with country specific economic assessments and evaluation of country specific constraints amongst others. And it could take uh, different forms, this capacity building uh, support that we're, we're providing could be just in form of uh, roundtable discussions, uh, dialogues to get uh, feedback on uh, government policy steps, or it could be something a bit more uh, substantial uh, uh, providing technical assistance. But this again will be on a case by case basis where we've sort of gauged the country's uh, needs and of course their uh, appetite to get that sort of support. So just to let you know, the purpose of this, uh, uh, one of the intentions with this virtual launch is also to sort of get that conversation going. And we want uh, country representatives on the call to please feel free to reach out to us. Thomas and myself, I think we have our email on the, the slides uh, at the end. We will also share, but please feel free to reach out to us just to indicate your interest in participating in this um, technical assistance program that we are providing. Also important to mention that we're also not working in silos. We're also coordinating with our partners, the OECDs on the call here, I believe uh, ATAF and a few others, just so that we're not sort of duplicating efforts and making the support, uh, support uh, redundant. So from our side, we also just want to say a very big thank you to everyone for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed today's session. Uh, we understand that navigating these reforms is not an easy one, uh, as it's not, um, it's not one that will not be without trade-offs. You know, we understand that tax incentives still have a role to play. They are well tailored and targeted and motivate the right uh, behavior. But from our side, we hope to continue playing a very important role as the global minimum tax uh, gains momentum particularly in the area of capacity building support for our government partners who are looking to implement GLOBE or even explore the option to, impl uh, to implement a response to, to GLOBE. So for now, we just say a very big thank you. It was a real pleasure having you join us. Enjoy the rest of your day and week. Thank you.